Welcome to a fireside reading of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapter 91. The Pequod Meets the Rosebud. In vain it was to rake for ambergris in the paunch of this leviathan, insufferable fetter, denying not inquiry. Sir T. Brown, V.E. It was a week or two after the last whaling scene recounted, and when we were slowly sailing over a sleepy, vapory midday sea, that the many noses on the Pequod's deck proved more vigilant discoverers than the three pairs of eyes aloft. A peculiar and not very pleasant smell was smelt in the sea. I will bet something now, said Stubb, that somewhere hereabouts are some of those drugged whales we tickled the other day. I thought they would keel up before long. Presently the vapours in advance slid aside, and there in the distance lay a ship whose furled sails betokened that some sort of whale must be alongside. As we glided nearer, the stranger showed French colours from his peak, and by the eddying cloud of vulture sea-fowl that circled and hovered and swooped around him, it was plain that the whale alongside must be what the fishermen call a blasted whale, that is, a whale that has died unmolested on the sea, and so floated an unappropriated corpse. It may well be conceived that an unsavory odor such a mass must exhale, worse than an Assyrian city in the plague, when the living are incompetent to bury the departed. So intolerable, indeed, is it regarded by some that no cupidity could persuade them to moor alongside of it. Yet are there those who will still do it, notwithstanding the fact that the oil obtained from such subjects is of a very inferior quality and by no means of the nature of attar of rose. Coming still nearer with the expiring breeze, we saw that the Frenchman had a second whale alongside, and this second whale seemed even more of a nosegay than the first. In truth, it turned out to be one of those problematical whales that seem to dry up and die with a sort of prodigious dyspepsia or indigestion, leaving their defunct bodies almost entirely bankrupt of anything like oil. Nevertheless, in the proper place, we shall see that no knowing fisherman will ever turn up his nose at such a whale as this, however much he may shun blasted whales in general. The Pequod had now swept so nigh to the stranger that Stubb vowed he recognized his cutting spade pole entangled in the lines that were knotted round the tail of one of these whales. There, there's a pretty fellow now, he banteringly laughed, standing in the ship's bows. There's a jackal for ye. I well know that these crapples of Frenchmen are but poor devils in the fishery, sometimes lowering their boats for breakers, mistaking them for sperm whale spouts. <laughs> yes, and sometimes sailing from their port with their hold full of boxes of tallow candles and cases of snuffers, foreseeing that all the oil they will get won't be enough to dip the captain's wick into. Aye, we all know these things, but... Look ye, here's a crapo that is content with our leavings. The drugged whale there, I mean. Aye, and is content too with scraping the dry bones of that other precious fish he has there, poor devil, I say. Pass round a hat, someone, and let's make him a present of a little oil for dear charity's sake. For what oil he'll get from that drugged whale there won't be fit to burn in a jail. 
No, not in a condemned cell. And as for the other whale, while I'll agree to get more oil by chopping up and trying our three masts of ours, than he'll get from that bundle of bones, though now that I think of it, it may contain something worth a good deal more than oil. Yes, amber grease. I wonder now if our old man has thought of that. It's worth trying. Yes, I'm for it. And so saying, he started for the quarter deck. By this time, the faint air had become a complete calm, so that whether or no the Pequod was now fairly entrapped in the smell, with no hope of escaping except by its breezing up again. Issuing from the cabin, Stubb now called his boat's crew and pulled off for the stranger. Drawing across her bow, he perceived that in accordance with the fanciful French taste, the upper part of her stem piece was carved in the likeness of a huge drooping stalk, was painted green, and for thorns had copper spikes projecting from it here and there, the whole terminating in a symmetrical folded bulb of a bright red colour. Upon her headboards, in large gilt letters, he read, Bouton de Rose, Rose Button, or Rose Bud, and this was the romantic name of the aromatic ship. Though Stubb did not understand the Bouton part of the inscription, Yet the word rose and the bulbous figurehead put together sufficiently explained the whole to him. A, a wooden rose, buddy, he cried with his hand to his nose. That will do very well, but how like all creation it smells. Now, in order to hold direct communication with the people on deck, he had to pull round the bows to the starboard side, and thus come close to the blasted whale, and so talk over it. Arrived then at this spot, with one hand still to his nose, he bawled, Bouton de Rose! Ahoy! Are there any of you Bouton de Roses that speak English? Yes! rejoined a Guernsey man from the bulwarks, who turned out to be the chief mate. Well then, my boot on the rosebud, have you seen the white whale? What whale? The white whale, a sperm whale, Moby Dick, have you seen him? Never heard of such a whale. Cachelot Blanche, white whale, no. Very good then. Good boy now, and I'll call again in a minute. Then, rapidly pulling back towards the Pequod and seeing Ahab leaning over the quarter-deck rail, awaiting his report, he moulded his two hands into a trumpet and shouted, No, sir! No! Upon which Ahab retired and Stubb returned to the Frenchman. He now perceived that the Guernsey man, who had just got into the chains and was using a cutting spade, had slung his nose in a sort of bag. "'What's the matter with your nose there?' said Stubb. "'Broke it?' "'I wish it was broken, or that I didn't have any nose at all.' answered the Guernsey man, who did not seem to relish the job he was at very much. But what are you holding your nose for? Oh, nothing, it's a wax nose. I have to hold it on. Fine day, ain't it? Air rather gardeny, I should say. Throw us a bunch of poses, will you, boot on the roses? "'What in the devil's name do you want here?' roared the Guernsey man, flying into a sudden passion. "'Oh, keep cool, cool. 
Yes, that's a word. Why don't you pack those whales in ice while you're working at them? But, joking aside, though, do you know, Rosebud, that it's all nonsense trying to get any oil out of such whales? As for that dried-up one there, he hasn't a gill in his whole carcass. I know that well enough. But do you see, the captain here won't believe it. This is his first voyage. He was a cologne manufacturer before. But come aboard, and mayhap he'll believe you if he won't me, and so I'll get out of this dirty scrape. Anything to oblige ye, my sweet and pleasant fellow? Rejoined Stubb, and with that he soon mounted to the deck. There was a queer scene presented itself there. The sailors in tasseled caps of red worsted were getting the heavy tackles in readiness for the whales, but they worked rather slow and talked very fast and seemed in anything but a good humor. All their noses upwardly projected from their faces like so many jib-booms. Now and then pairs of them would drop their work and run up to the masthead to get some fresh air, some thinking they would catch the plague, dipped oakum in coal tar, and at intervals held it to their nostrils. Others, having broken the stems of their pipes, almost short off at the bowl, were vigorously puffing smoke tobacco, so that it constantly filled their olfactories. Stubb was struck by a shower of outcries and anathemas proceeding from the captain's roundhouse abaft, and looking in that direction saw a fiery face thrust from behind the door, which was held ajar from within. This was the tormented surgeon, who, after in vain remonstrating against the proceedings of the day, had betaken himself to the captain's roundhouse, cabinet, he called it, to avoid the pest, but still could not help yelling out his entreaties and indignations at times. Marking all this, Stubb argued well for his scheme, and turning to the Guernseyman, had a little chat with him, during which the stranger mate expressed his detestation of his captain, as a conceited ignoramus who had brought them all into so unsavory and unprofitable a pickle. Sounding him carefully, Stubb further perceived that the Guernsey man had not the slightest suspicion concerning the ambergris. He therefore held his peace on that head, but otherwise was quite frank and confidential with him, so that the two quickly concocted a little plan for both circumventing and satirizing the captain, without his at all dreaming of distrusting their sincerity. According to this little plan of theirs, the Guernsey man, under cover of an interpreter's office, was to tell the captain what he pleased, but as coming from Stubb. And as for Stubb, he was to utter any nonsense that should come uppermost in him during the interview. By this time, their destined victim appeared from his cabin. He was a small and dark, but rather delicate-looking man for a sea captain, with large whiskers and moustache, however, and wore a red cotton velvet vest with watch seals at his side. To this gentleman, Stubb was now politely introduced by the Guernsey man, who at once ostentatiously put on the aspect of interpreting between them. "'What shall I say to him first? said he. "'Why?' said Stubb, eyeing the velvet vest and the watch and seals. "'You may as well begin by telling him that he looks a sort of babyish to me, though I don't pretend to be a judge.' He says, monsieur, said the Guernsey man in French, turning to his captain, that only yesterday his ship spoke a vessel whose captain and chief mate with six sailors had all died of a fever caught from a blasted whale they had brought alongside. 
Upon this, the captain started and eagerly desired to know more. "'What now?' said the Guernsey man to Stubb. "'Why, since he takes it so easy, tell him that now I have eyed him carefully, I'm quite certain that he's no more fit to command a whale-ship than a St. Jago monkey. In fact, tell him from me he's a baboon.' He vows and declares, monsieur, that the other whale, the dried one, is far more deadly than the blasted one. In fine, monsieur, he conjures us, as we value our lives, to cut loose from these fish. Instantly the captain ran forward, and in a loud voice commanded his crew to desist from hoisting the cutting tackles, and at once cast loose the cables and chains confining the whales to the ship. "'What now?' said the Guernsey man, when the captain had returned to them. "'Why, let me see. Yes, you may as well tell him now that, that in fact, tell him I've diddled him, and aside to himself, perhaps, and aside to himself, perhaps somebody else. He says, monsieur, that he is very happy to have been of any service to us. Hearing this, the captain vowed that they were the grateful parties, meaning himself and mate, and concluded by inviting Stubb down into his cabin to drink a bottle of Bordeaux. He wants you to take a glass of wine with him, said the interpreter. Thank him heartily, but tell him it's against my principles to drink with the man I diddled. In fact, tell him I must go. He says, monsieur, that his principles won't admit of his drinking, but that if monsieur wants to live another day to drink, then monsieur had best drop all four boats and pull the ship away from these whales, for it's so calm they won't drift. By this time, Stubb was over the side and getting into his boat, hailed the Guernsey man to this effect, that having a long tow-line in his boat, he would do what he could to help them by pulling out the lighter whale of the two from the ship's side. While the Frenchman's boats then were engaged in towing the ship one way, Stubb benevolently towed away at his whale the other way, ostentatiously slacking out a most unusually long tow-line. Presently a breeze sprang up, Stubb feigned to cast off from the whale, hoisting his boats, the Frenchman soon increased his distance, while the Pequod slid in between him and Stubb's whale. Whereupon Stubb quickly pulled to the floating body, and hailing the Pequod to give notice of his intentions, at once proceeded to reap the fruit of his unrighteous cunning. Seizing his sharp boat spade, he commenced an excavation in the body, a little behind the side fin. You would almost have thought he was digging a cellar there in the sea, and when at length his spade struck against the gaunt ribs, it was like turning up old Roman tiles and pottery buried in fat English loam. His boat's crew were all in high excitement, eagerly helping their chief and looking as anxious as gold hunters. And all the time, numberless fowls were diving and ducking and screaming and yelling and fighting around them. Stubb was beginning to look disappointed, especially as the horrible nosegay increased, when suddenly, from out the very heart of this plague, there stole a faint stream of perfume which flowed through the tide of bad smells without being absorbed by it, as one river will flow into and then along with another without at all blending with it for a time. I have it! I have it! cried Stubb with delight, striking something in the subterraneous regions. A purse! A purse! Dropping his spade, he thrust both hands in and drew out handfuls of something that looked like ripe Windsor soap or rich mottled old cheese, 
very unctuous and savory withal. You might easily dent it with your thumb. It is of a hue between yellow and ash color. And this, good friends, is ambergris, worth a gold guinea an ounce to any druggist. Some six handfuls were obtained, but more was unavoidably lost in the sea, and still more, perhaps, might have been secured were it not for impatient Ahab's loud command to stub, to desist, and come on board, else the ship would bid them goodbye. Chapter 92 Ambergris Now this ambergris is a very curious substance, and so important as an article of commerce that in 1791, a certain Nantucket-born Captain Coffin was examined at the bar of the English House of Commons on that subject. For at that time, and indeed until a comparatively late day, the precise origin of ambergris remained, like amber itself, a problem to the learned. Though the word ambergris is but the French compound for grey amber, yet the two substances are quite distinct, for amber, though at times found on the seacoast, is also dug up in some far inland soils, whereas ambergris is never found except upon the sea. Besides, amber is a hard, transparent, brittle, odorless substance used for mouthpieces to pipes, for beads and ornaments. But ambergris is soft, waxy, and so highly fragrant and spicy that it is largely used in perfumery, in pastilles, precious candles, hair powders, and pomatum. The Turks use it in cooking and also carry it to Mecca for the same purpose that frankincense is carried to St. Peter's in Rome. Some wine merchants drop a few grains into claret to flavor it. Who would think, then, that such fine ladies and gentlemen should regale themselves with an essence found in the inglorious bowels of a sick whale? Yet so it is. By some, ambergris is supposed to be the cause, and by others the effect, of the dyspepsia in the whale. How to cure such a dyspepsia it were hard to say, unless by administering three or four boatloads of Brandreth's pills, and then running out of harm's way, as laborers do in blasting rocks. I have forgotten to say that there were found in this ambergris certain hard, round, bony plates, which at first Stubb thought might be sailor's trousers buttons. But it afterwards turned out that they were nothing more than pieces of small squid bones embalmed in that matter. Now that the incorruption of this most fragrant ambergris should be found in the heart of such decay, is this nothing? Bethink thee of that saying of St. Paul in Corinthians about corruption and incorruption, how that we are sown in dishonor but raised in glory. And likewise call to mind that saying of Paracelsus about what it is that maketh the best musk. Also, forget not the strange fact that of all things of ill savor, cologne water in its rudimental manufacturing stages is the worst. I should like to conclude the chapter with the above appeal, but cannot, owing to my anxiety to repel a charge often made against whalemen, and which, in the estimation of some already biased minds, might be considered as indirectly substantiated by what has been said of the Frenchman's two whales. Elsewhere in this volume, the slanderous aspersion has been disproved that the vocation of whaling is throughout 
a slatternly, untidy business. But there is another thing to rebut. They hint that all whales always smell bad. Now, how did this odious stigma originate? I opine that it is plainly traceable to the first arrival of the Greenland whaling ships in London more than two centuries ago, because those whalemen did not then and do not now try out their oil at sea, as the southern ships have always done, but cutting up the fresh blubber in small bits, thrust it through the bungholes of large casks and carry it home in that manner, the shortness of the season in those icy seas and the sudden and violent storms to which they are exposed, forbidding any other course. The consequence is that upon breaking into the hold and unloading one of these whale cemeteries, in the Greenland dock a savour is given forth somewhat similar to that arising from excavating an old city graveyard for the foundations of a lying-in hospital. I partly surmise also that this wicked charge against whalers may be likewise imputed to the existence on the coast of Greenland in former times of a Dutch village called Schmerenberg or Smeerenberg, which latter name is the one used by the learned Fogo von Slack in his great work on smells, a textbook on that subject. As its name imports smear, fat, berg, to put up, this village was founded in order to afford a place for the blubber of the Dutch whale fleet to be tried out without being taken home to Holland for that purpose. It was a collection of furnaces, fat kettles, and oil sheds, and when the works were in full operation, certainly gave forth no very pleasant savour. But all this is quite different with the South Sea sperm whaler, which, in a voyage of four years, perhaps, after completely filling her hold with oil, does not, perhaps, consume fifty days in the business of boiling out, and in the state that it is casked, the oil is nearly scentless. The truth is that living or dead, if but decently treated, whales as a species are by no means creatures of ill odour, nor can whale men be recognised, as the people of the Middle Ages affected to detect a Jew in the company by the nose. Nor indeed can the whale possibly be otherwise than fragrant, when as a general thing he enjoys such high health, taking abundance of exercise, always out of doors, though it is true, seldom in the open air. I say that the motion of a sperm whale's flukes above water dispenses a perfume, as when a musk-scented lady rustles her dress in a warm parlour. What, then, shall I liken the sperm whale to for fragrance, considering his magnitude? Must it not be to that famous elephant, with jewelled tusks and redolent with myrrh, which was led out of an Indian town to do honour to Alexander the Great? Thanks for joining me. My name is Gilda Jackson, and this is Fireside Reading every day at 5 Pacific, at Fireside Reading on Instagram. And please check out the YouTube channel, Fireside Reading, where you can find all the chapters of all the books we've read together. If you would like, and if you do like, please like, comment, and subscribe. Until I see you again, please be very well. Goodbye.